Well, it finally happened. Disney's announced paid fast pass to its domestic parks. And what's that mean for you and your future trips? Our panel talks about that tonight. We'll also catch you up on all the latest parks news and more tonight on Park Center. Welcome to Park Center for August 22nd, 2021. I'm your host, Rob Whiteside, and tonight, oh man, we have an illustrious panel of Disney Parks fans and friends. Uh, with me tonight is Mr. Eric Morton. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Rob. How are you doing? Just great. Well, well hang on. We'll see how great you are by the end. Uh, Kamila Sanders? <laughs> I'm doing great, and if it's Sunday, it's Park Center. Woo! I like it. And Mr. Matt Arterberry, how are you, buddy? See, Vaco, it's been a great week in Disney Parks news, in my opinion. So we'll see how this, <laughs> see how this tonight goes for everyone. You know, you know when the, uh, I hope you guys took the red pill tonight because we're going to get real about some Disney stuff. And uh, the, the announced Disney Fast Pass, the paid Fast Pass system that all the kids are talking about, we're going to talk about that at the end of the show, but we wanted to cover a little bit of news first. Uh, so this week, it's been crazy. We don't even have time to talk about like Green Pavement and Adventureland or Golden Statues or Disney Wish announcements or Drawn to Life uh, or mass changes in the park. Uh, and honestly, I thought this was going to be our big topic of the week was the announcement that the NBA experience closed. Like, oh, come on. At the beginning of the week, I thought, hey, we're going to talk about this. Shocking and, revelation. Yeah, exactly. Too soon. So too soon. Too soon. <laughs> Uh, you know what? It did close too soon. It closed after seven months. Uh, you know, there was this thing that opened in 1998 uh, called uh, Disney Disney Quest. And um, Eric, you were just a, a little pup then. But when Disney Quest opened up, uh, they, <laughs> they were like, hey, uh, here's this great thing. It was there for a couple decades. They took it down to put up this NBA experience. Did you ever go, Eric? To the NBA experience? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, look, I like basketball. I'm from the state of Kansas. Basketball's in my blood. I'm not interested in the NBA experience. I can go shoot free throws for free at any park in town. I'm not going to pay for the pleasure of it. So, no, I, I'm i one of those people. I was never interested in it. I never thought it was going to work. Um, I guess I've been proven right, uh, sadly. <laughs> uh, of course, that west side could really use uh, some kind of uh, draw. And uh, NBA experience didn't cut it. it. You know, who knows what they're going to do. I, I didn't expect it to work out. Um, we made fun of it a lot, uh, maybe unfairly, but probably fairly. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out. So there's a lot of square footage uh, up available now at Disney Springs. And hopefully somebody who can uh, really carry their weight is going to take their place. Well, I think Kamila has some other thoughts about that topic because she's nodding her head. Look Look, we get it, Disney fans. You're not athletic. No, I'm kidding. Oh, um, <laughs> oh straight to the gut. Ah. <laughs> no, I, look, I, I the NBA experience uh, got made fun of so much in a way that I, I thought was maybe too much. And it kind of just felt like the Disney parks people, like, okay, you know, you don't like basketball. Maybe you don't play it. You don't see the value in it. I actually had quite a few clients um, when they add their water sport, water and sports option to their ticket package ask uh, while the NBA experience was closed, like, is it going to be open in time for our visit? So I think there are, you know, there were people um, that sought this out, thought it was a cool experience. And I think from Disney's perspective, they're looking for a way to kind of continue to add in uh, their other big money maker, which is ESPN. They make a ton of money off of their sports royalties uh, and that ESPN programming. And so I understand them wanting to try to, you know, bring that into the parks as another way to advertise and maybe grow audience. I don't know, but I agree it didn't work. Uh, I hope they bring in something else that is a good fit um, and long live the NBA experience. Wow, long live! It didn't actually do that. Um, and, and I take I take slight offense to that whole thing about Disney Parks fans and not being athletic. You know what? I like sports. I mean, I am a fan, and so I wanted to actually see this, and didn't didn't even get a chance to because it was open for such a short amount of time. It was very anticipated. It finally opened, and I think maybe some of the reasons some of these people want to see it is because they've never seen it before. When I go to Disney, and it's been a while, I have a checklist of all mm -hmm. these things that are new that I want to do just because I've never done them before. So I would guess. 
That was probably <laughs> part of it. Uh, and not yeah. that they were like, oh, I got to get me down to Disney and get that NBA experience. Because, like, there's a movie <laughs> theater next door, right? A the AMC. That's right. It's not like I'm like, hmm, I got to get down and see me, like, a, a movie at that AMC. It, it just doesn't feel that way. So the Disney Quest yeah. problem that I have is that it was there for decades. And it was it started to get, you know, kind of outdated. And, and it was still, mm -hmm. to me, a little bit fun. And if they kind of like the great movie ride, I feel like if they had fixed it up or kept it going, then maybe it would have had some, some remaining appeal. The thing that gets me, though, is that right after they closed it down, the void opened up and the void, and, I mean, in more ways than one, I mean, the void opened and it had this great experience over there that was a paid experience that I thought, wow, wouldn't it have been cool if you could have done that on a larger scale in what Disney uh, Quest was? So now that they've got all the square footage, Disney, if you're listening, I feel like you need to have multiple experiences like the void now that that's been shut down uh, in that building and really kind of make it something that's, again, for families. And maybe the NBA experience was for families, too. But yeah. I mean, to me, it was not and something my family ever wanted to do. Well, and can I just say really quickly to kind of add on to all of that, <clears throat> you know, I do think we have to keep in mind, uh, and who knows what to what extent uh, this went into why they built the NBA experience in the first place, but it was uh, included in the water and sports option, which I maybe a lot of people don't know, but you know, if you want to be able to have multiple visits to Blizzard Beach, Typhoon Lagoon, if it ever reopens, um, mini golf, uh, and the NBA experience, like these were all things that were included. And so, you know, who knows if Disney put it there to have it be a part of that offering to strengthen it, um, or who knows if what will return could be something that could also be used in a similar capacity, because now we're down to like, you know, one mini golf experience and one water park. So, uh, you know, if they still want to be able to sell that add on, they need something. Welcome to the Bob Chapek era. So, um, well, there's that parking lot 5K. <laughs> the parking lot 5K, true. <laughs> Um, so, you know what, and again, I see in the chat, everybody's getting restless, everybody's ready to talk about the, our topic tonight, and we're definitely going to get to it, um, but this is actually kind of not great either, is uh, I called this section Broke Bots, because this week we had not just one broken animatronic at, um, at the Grand Fiesta, not just two with poor Abe pulling off his Ace Ventura impression, and not just three with Hondo, which this is the most unsettling one, where he just like collapses as if he's been turned off like some Westworld dummy. And then the last one was this aerial one, which, you know, the poor girl has been down and out. So, uh, Eric, I'm going to go back to you on this one. Uh, don't just stop maintenance, my friend. Yeah, I think the most surprising part of this is Abraham Lincoln seeing as the Hall of Presidents just came out of refurbishment like a couple weeks ago. So literally, they had uh, a month or a couple months they spent uh, retooling that ride, cleaning it up, adding a new animatronic, rearranging things, presumably doing maintenance, maybe getting in there with a the Swiffer and getting some of the dust out of it. I don't know. But it, immediately coming out of refurbishment to have uh, pretty much your flagship animatronic fail so spectacularly is a little disturbing. I know these things happen, but it uh, it's not a good look. As far as uh, the Donald animatronic, I have to think that um, that thing had had been put back together with bailing wire and duct tape and chew, chewing gum or something. You know, I, I think um, that one's going to keep breaking for a while. Uh, first time I've seen Ariel freak out like that. That's kind of cool. Hondo, I don't know. That's a complicated animatronic, so... Yeah, but to, uh, to, 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 have some problems. to see this happen in show where he's there, he's talking, and all of a sudden it's just like, oh, I mean, it just, uh, that's like. He look, you know what it looks like? One of those television preachers that's healing people. He just hits <laughs> them and they, they fall back. <laughs> so, Great. Uh, hopefully he's okay. Fantastic. Kamila, say some positive things. I don't have anything positive to say. I think this is kind of unacceptable. Um, if you're going to have these animatronics that are so well done, uh, they do need to work. I mean, that's a part of the experience. And I just feel for those guests where maybe it's the first time they've been on that attraction, the first time they've been at Disney, um, it, it's very clear that something is wrong. Uh, I don't know that it ruins you know, the entire attraction in any of these cases, but it's not a good look. But I, I will say, in Disney's defense, uh, I think that, you know, it's a lot to maintain, um, and if it's not a priority to make sure that things work, uh, you know, this is this is what happens. Yeah, no, you're right. So, um, 
I, I don't know what else we can possibly say about that one other than the fact that it's just it's unfortunate that um, that with months of, of these things being down and Eric, like you talked about, the Hall of Presidents was down for refurbishment. You would think this would be included in that. And it just seems like four in one week seems just insane. We see these things mm -hmm. every now and then. Our Ursula's head falls off or the auctioneer in Paris. But four on the East Coast at the like in the same week just seems like there's something bigger at play here. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't. I like you. I like you trying to be uh, positive, Kamila, but I think in this one, it's it's a little hurt. Uh, so we're gonna yeah. move on to this next one because speaking of uh, other things breaking, um, our our good friend Jason Diffendahl wrote this article in 2018 about the uncertain future of the monorail system and the fact that how long it's been around in the Mark IVs and when they got put on the tracks and it was it's been decades and they they uh, they should have been off already. Now what they've done is they've taken them in put this really cool like you know wall carpet on them uh they do look fine and fancy these things that they've done here i'm i'm, I'm impressed by that what I, I think is unimpressive is they shut down this week uh two of them not just one but two so we lost uh the monorail orange as it was just getting ready to come into the uh contemporary uh tom joked that he thought that it was uh, the monorails fighting back after the announcements about the <laughs> fast pass being paid um, and then the next, we had the silver one stop um, on the Epcot line. So, you know, monorail has always been one of my favorite things, and it just makes me sad to see this happening. And I don't know, I don't, I mean, we've not heard any future in sight of any of them being replaced. Um, Kamila, can you, can you, uh, can you enlighten me? Uh, can you put in some money? Maybe we should do a Kickstarter to get them some more monorails. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they should have um, pay, a paid fast pass system <laughs> to raise some money for this. I don't know. It seems like that could be an option uh, or too soon, too soon. Um, I, again, you, you need these kinds of things to work, especially because the monorails are such a selling point for resorts that are significantly more expensive among a sea of expensive resorts that they offer at Disney World. So you need the monorails uh, to be reliable. You need them to be working. You do not want guests to get stuck on them. I understand things happen, but when last week it's the Skyliner and this week it's the monorail, uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it does start to look like things are falling apart. And when you're asking people to spend seven, ten thousand dollars uh, for this wonderful week at Disney, you need these things to work. You just do. Yep. Uh, Eric, Skyliner, monorail, what's a bigger disaster these days? I don't know. Um, the Skyliner is always going to be temperamental because of weather, right? Uh, the monorail, though, this has to be bulletproof. 99.99999% uptime type of thing for uh, the Magic Kingdom, right? So it's one thing if like, it's one thing if Ariel's freaking out every now and then, uh, you have some animatronics, but the maintenance on these monorails, they're, what are they? I think they're about 30 years old. Yeah. And um, I have seen, they are doing some electrical work on the track. Um, I don't know if that had any connection to this incident. I'll say also where Orange stopped is like the highest, scariest, Point, I mean, not that the monorail is a scary attraction, right? But that's like the highest point of the monorail where you're just before you come into contemporary. It, it's like a good, you know, I don't know, 70 feet up in the air or something like that. I mean, a little uncomfortable for guests. But your, your transportation there, those monorails and ferries, they have to be bulletproof. And I don't know what kind of investment it's going to take. I believe they have one monorail that um, sits backstage that literally is like the Frankenstein that they just take parts from at this point. Um, I've seen it out on the tracks a few times. Um, obviously, this is an aging uh, product that is probably due for replacement, but we haven't heard anything. Um, the, you know, maybe maybe there's good news around the corner. There's been rumors in the past, but unfortunately, uh, these these things just keep breaking down, and uh, somebody's got to do better. But yeah, and I agree 100%. My thing is, it's iconic, right? Like, you know, take a drink, iconic. Right. Um, that That's the thing as a kid that I always look forward to. And there's so many different things that, you know, there was the crash and now you can't be in the front. And, you know, again, that's all safety. I get that. But it just seems to be like, that's not the thing that it used to be. And it feels like that was the futuristic welcome to Walt Disney World. You have to get to the Magic Kingdom by ferry or monorail. And I always wanted it to be monorail. And it's just, it, I can't imagine what those people were going through. You're on your vacation, you're paying all this money, and then you get stopped for how long? Where you hey, wait. take out the windows. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I, you know what, though? I think I'd be like, wow, I never got to take out the windows on a monorail before. This is yeah. really fun. This is a new experience I, for me. 
I never got to rappel out of a monorail before. Let me try that. I'm all about new Disney experiences. So whatever it can be, yeah, let's let's make it happen. Honestly, I like to be like, you know, evac from a ride so that I can see behind the scenes. So um, maybe that's the same thing. But when it's just like the B, I don't know. It's a thing. So let's move on to something else, which everybody loves doing in uh, in 2021, which is touching stuff. So the uh, biometrics uh, finger scanners are looking to return soon to um, to the uh, to the parks. Um, I, I thought this was something we were going to find a way to do away with because of COVID and germs and things like that. They covered them up. You scan in. I get that it's kind of like a security issue where you can't identify people if you're not doing a biometric screening or using like they do at Disneyland where they, you know, they have your picture whenever uh, they scan you in. So I feel like they, they would be better to go to that system where you have your picture associated with it rather than touching things. I, I don't know if anybody else has a problem with this, but Kamali, um, I'm going to throw it to you and see what your thoughts thoughts are on it. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting because at Disneyland, they do go by the picture system. Um, I, I do think that takes just a tad bit longer, and I do think it <clears throat> leads to backups a little bit more. Um, I was surprised they were bringing this back, especially uh, so soon. Um, but I would imagine if they are moving forward with it, especially given the current conditions uh, of Orlando, there probably is a reason. Um, and Disney would know better than anyone, you know, what they're trying to prevent and, and you know, how they want to know who's in the park. So it, it kind of makes me nervous that they're bringing it back. Um, but I would imagine there's a reason for it. Yeah. Um, Matt, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not really concerned about it or um, happy the way it's, it's a non issue to me. I, I, I'm, I'm fine using my fingerprint. Um, I'm, I'm already taking my chance per se walking into the parks. So <laughs> using my fingerprint on a scanner isn't the greatest of my worries. So uh, I think if they need it for security, then I want to be safe in the parks. And if that's one way they can do it, then I think they should keep doing it. Okay. That's fair. Um, Eric. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think universal ever stopped doing the fingerprints. Uh, at least the, if they did stop, they've been using the fingerprints for a very long time again now. So um, I don't know what Disney's concern was about this. I know originally um, when COVID kind of first became a thing that everyone was very concerned about touching surfaces and wiping down surfaces. And now there's uh, less concern about that. Uh, the more that they discover about how this virus is transmitted. So uh, if Disney feels it's safe, I feel like they have to be following some sort of best practices and, and go ahead, bring it back. All right. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Again, I just think, and the less like interactive touch surfaces the pos that are possible, the better. But I, I get what you're saying. Universal did stop for a little while uh, because they were checking IDs, which was kind of a pain. Because a lot of people, yeah. like you know, my son doesn't really carry his ID with him everywhere he goes because he's not going to drink and he's you know, he hasn't needed it. And so, like you know, when he gets stopped and it's like, oh, we need your driver's license out of the blue, that was something that he wasn't used to trying to do. So they did stop for a little while. I think they have been back, like you said, for a while. I think they wipe after every one. So hopefully we'll see them being that diligent um, at Disney. So another thing I wanted to touch on real quick, which is actually kind of a positive, cool thing, is that Disney has still been um, tweaking with animatronics, uh, you know, trying new things. And they've got this new thing that they were showing that it doesn't say Hulk, but we think it's going to be Hulk. That this is going to be a walk around Hulk uh, animatronic sort of, not animatronic, I guess, but kind of an interactive figure that would walk around the parks. That to me would be amazing because I feel like Universal's done a good job with that kind of thing with like Optimus Prime, um, you know, kind of these larger than life characters, not making it look maybe cheesy, but making it look like, hey, this is really Hulk. Now, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to pull Hulk off because I don't know if you guys ever watched, there was a Touring Marvel show where Hulk just looked horrible i mean it was so bad it was just like a guy wearing a big inflatable outfit from here up and it was just it was it, mm, not good um but i think this this looks kind of fun i don't really know that i we need to stop and talk about it unless anybody has any thoughts comments concerns about it i, I just, just like to, to say maybe our brightest minds with animatronics should be busy with the ones that are breaking <laughs> down all the time in the parks before we before we go any further with this hulk animatronic 
Well, I mean, there's there was the baby Groot that we saw walking around, or the kid Groot that was cool. Um, and you know, the, lucky the dinosaur mm -hmm. back in the day with that whole initiative and the Muppet Labs. You don't see those things a lot because they never seem to work. It almost seemed like a pet project, like Jake the Robot, those kind of things. Where where we see them, and it's like, hey, this is cool stuff we can do. Where are they? Like, where do they bring them out in the parks? And when they do, like, oh, bring Wally -E out into the park, it's just for a little bit and for a special occasion, and then he goes back because they can't make it work on a long term basis. So. Um, you know, I, I hope this doesn't look a very huge into animatronics. It looks like it's a lot of exoskeleton uh, maneuvers and things that they're figuring out with it. But um, I mean, I, it would be really cool to do that and see Hulk. And I think we would all. I mean, we got we get excited when we see Kevin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not not Kevin Lake from WDWNT. I mean, he's he, he, he's all right too. Um, so speaking of sort of COVID related things, uh, buffets are returning. I'm not sure if I thought that this would happen as quickly as it is, but we saw we first got news that the Boma buffet would return, uh, and then we got confirmation. We had this great review uh, of Boma buffet uh, at Animal Kingdom Lodge. There they had brought back the one in California first and then this uh, this one and now we have announcements that they're going to be uh, bringing this to Crystal Palace and then also to Beer Garden very soon which is I mean it's one of those things that like we always think about I think with Disney restaurants is either character meals or these buffets which give your family like an option to like have a little bit of this a little bit of that I think that's kind of a cool thing I know that some people have other thoughts on that um, I think that Patrick uh, from uh, Park Center liked the idea that people would bring family style to his table and he didn't have to deal with it. Um, so, uh, Eric, what are your thoughts? Good, bad, ugly? Um, I'm a big fan of the Beer Garden Buffet. <laughs> and I know that some people on our staff, including Tom, are like, eh, but it sure is a lot better now that's family style. And I say, incorrect. I love the buffet. I love going <laughs> through and picking my own meal out of a large smorgasbord of options. Um, I'm all about it. I feel safe at this point uh, doing that, wearing a mask indoors, you know, when you're not seated at your table going through the buffet line. I'm okay with that. Um, I hope uh, I hope they come back and stay back. I know a, a large group of us um, went to Boma on Friday for breakfast and um, Boma for uh, dinner on Friday. I unfortunately did not get to go to either one of those, uh, but everyone said it was a hit. Cool. Kamila? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, exciting in general that BOMA is reopening. I had a client that she didn't, the only dining she wanted in Disney World was BOMA. And so it was so much fun to be like, guess what? It's opening. And she got her reservation. Um, uh, you know, I think the return of buffets uh is okay and i think it kind of is inevitable given the uh some of the worker shortages we're seeing in uh restaurants in general um if you have a buffet i think it's a little easier to manage compared to the family style where they had to kind of constantly be coming up to you and bringing you more or you know checking in on that um and i i don't think guests are really going to notice uh, or care either way. I think if you're someone who's booking something like this, uh, it probably won't bother you uh, one way or the other. That's a great point about staffing. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I I think the return to buffets is beneficial in certain restaurants like Boma and uh, the Beer Garden, but um, I think in my experience when I was back, back there back in July, uh, we went to Crystal Palace, and I think one thing I really enjoyed was being able to pick up an entree, and then obviously the shared starter. So uh, I think the restaurants that went with the shared entree option, or not the uh, the singular entree option, and then the shared uh, starters and sides, uh, I think that was a better experience for me personally because you pretty fresh food coming out of the kitchen. Um, but I think the restaurants that were in a state of pretty much family style the whole time um, from started to, to entree. I think going back to the traditional buffet style is beneficial um, because to me, it's not, 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 not much big of a difference um, in terms of quality of food. So uh, if it's going to help out the worker um, cast member issues, then uh, Okay, cool. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So uh, we heard that Enchantment was going to be replacing, uh, we heard this back when it was called, I guess, Project Nugget, uh, that it was going to be replacing Happily Ever After, a very beloved show. Uh, now we find out that, you know, this was going to be launched on October 1st. It was going to be this great new show for uh, celebrating 
um, what we thought was going to be celebrating Walt Disney World's birthday, but what we find out is it doesn't look like that's what it's going to be, that it's going to be sort of just like the next generation replacement. I, I honestly don't know that I hate this, because if it's going to be around for a while, it should be a show that is representative of more than just the anniversary, and maybe it's just because it's a birthday, like it comes on its birthday doesn't mean it has to be about the history. Um there, there was, there were a couple shows specific to Disneyland and its birthday. One for World of Color and one in Disneyland. Did you see either of those, Kamila? And do you feel like it, it should be more about the birthday and less about the characters? I didn't catch um, either of those. Uh, to be honest, in my old days, uh, fireworks were a great excuse to take advantage of lower <laughs> lines uh, in the ride. So that's usually where you could catch me. Um, but. Uh, you know, I, this is tough because I, I, I want uh, Disney fans to kind of get something that they feel like is a little bit for them. Um, and I feel I felt like this was a little bit of an opportunity to do that. Uh, that being said, you know, with something like this, I, I really just don't I'm so hesitant to judge it before I actually have a chance to see it, hear it, um, see more. And I feel like what they've shown so far to me looks good. So, you know, we'll see what it looks like in real life. But hopefully they find a way to tie Walt in. Yeah. Um, Barge Gate 2021 again, all over. Uh, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty torn on this topic because I'm really sad that we're seeing Happily Ever After um, go its go its way, and I'm hoping that we. And I, I was really hoping this would be a celebration of the parks, um, especially for the 50th. And so hearing that it's just going to be an upgraded version of Happily Ever After, um, I feel kind of uh, slighted a little bit there. Um, so. Again, I hope it's better than Happily Ever After, so I'm not sad that it's gone. Um, but if I, I, I really hope they do fit, find a way to fit in the park history, because I think that's what we deserve as parks fans right now, um, especially with some of the lackluster announcements for the 50th. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping this would be kind of the shining light um, and actually bring in um, kind of a show for the Disney nerds in a way, but it seems like we're going to get another IP fest. So uh, I, and I, I know Happily Ever After was a big IP fest. I understand that, but I hope they find a way to tell a really important and concise story like they did with Happily Ever After um, and not just be a Epcot Forever kind of <laughs> re, <laughs> rehash Matt, for Matt, Magic Kingdom. So. Matt, who are you calling nerds? You call, are you calling us nerds? <laughs> I mean... Hey, I call myself a nerd too, so... Okay, all right. Uh, Eric... Thoughts? Okay. Um, Happily Ever After, uh, to me, is one of the best things that Disney World has done in the last few years. So losing really one of the things that I think is great about Disney World is, is a little painful, but I was willing to tolerate it knowing, hey, it's the 50th. So you would be uh, forgiven for assuming that the new show uh, that would be replacing it on October 1st because it's there to celebrate the 50th anniversary. So uh, it's a little confusing then to under to be told that, hey, no, it's going to focus on a lot of the new animated stuff, which is what Happily Ever After kind of does for the most part. There's very, very little old school uh, Disney stuff in there. So um, I don't really know what to expect on this. I would have loved to have had Jiminy Cricket back talking me through something, you know, through the years of Disney World or uh, even have music from maybe even Spectro Magic and some of these older things that they introduced throughout to celebrate the history of the yeah. Walt Disney World Resort. Um, maybe I'll be proven wrong. Maybe it'll be great. Uh, I'm trying to remain uh, open-minded on it because uh, obviously uh, living here, I I, uh, <laughs> I I hear and see it often. So hopefully it's something that's happy. You're, you don't want to just be, ah, oh, not this again. Um, no, I do think it's going to be an upgraded show. I think that'll be, that's kind of the thing, right, is it's going to be an upgraded show. I just look back, kind of like Matt talked about, like split about, you know, I, I was hoping it would be kind of about the legacy of Disney World. And, you know, I don't think right. that the, the Golden Statues have kind of achieved that. So, I, you know, it, it would be nice if something that they were doing was really kind of back to, uh, you know, the nostalgia of the past 50 years. I think that would mean a lot to Kamala, like you said, the kind of the, the super fans or like Matt called us nerds. Um, so, 
<laughs> I wanted to talk about this a little bit because of the contemporary, they, there's been a lot of changes that happened in the contemporary, and two things we saw in announcements were there was going to be a 50th anniversary dining experience um, that at the California Grill. It kind of alludes to the former top of the world. There's not a lot of information on this other than it's going to be um, – a, a new dining experience likely for the 50th anniversary. Uh, the other thing that was much more interesting to me was that we've been thinking that the wave was going to be uh, the incredible steakhouse. I made this goofy graphic for, for like way back in the day when I, you know, we found out that it might be that. And I was like, I don't know what the incredible steakhouse looks like. What's that? What does that look like? So this is basically the wave with the, uh, you know, the characters, uh, you know, put in front. Oh but yeah, it like, yeah, I don't know. So, it so, looks like that. so Steakhouse what? 71. Mignon? <laughs> Steakhouse 71. I like the logo. It looks very cool because it's the contemporary and it's got the 71 in it. The thing that I find ironic is that they just closed Steakhouse uh, 55. Um, 51. 51. Yeah. Oh, 55. 55. 55. 55. 1955. Yeah. Don't mess with me. I was, I was right on that one. 1955. So they closed 1955 or Steakhouse 55 in California, uh, from what we understand, permanently. And then to then like, mm -hmm. mo it's not not like they had to move it. I don't I don't know what. What do you think about this, Eric? Because I know you had your heart set on meet and greet with Jack Jack. No, uh, again, the wave is something that I thought Disney did right. I liked the wave, and I'm going to miss the wave. Uh, I'm glad it's not the Incredible Steakhouse. I never was on board with that idea that they were dumb enough to do Incredible Steakhouse, but <laughs> never <laughs> underestimate their stupidity. Um, what's funny also is California Grill, uh, the wave has been doing, I guess it's still called the wave, uh, the wave breakfast uh, has been moved up to California Grill temporarily. And um, actually one of the managers said, welcome to Top of the World to us a few weeks ago. So I was like, huh. So... You know, it's interesting. It'd be good to have it um, have top of the world, a uh, little retheming or whatever. I guess, as with all things, we'll just wait and see. <laughs> I don't know on this one. Yeah, um, let, let's jump ahead so we can get to our our main event. Um, the there were two breakfasts or two announcements that I thought were interesting. I kind of tied them together here. One is Cinderella's uh, Royal Table to return August twenty seventh at the Magic Kingdom for breakfast. Now it doesn't say there's going to be characters. It just says that they're going to be returning to breakfast. So there were two places to meet princesses back uh, before COVID. Uh, one of them was here, and the other one was the Akershus uh, in. Um, in Norway, and now that's going to be a Florida Blue Corporate Lounge. Wow. Lucky us. It's going to be a corporate lounge. Fantastic. Eric, are you, are you excited? Tell you what, we're going we're gonna to deny your claim for heart surgery, but why don't you join us at the Akershus Lounge for a complimentary beverage? I don't know. I don't like this idea of health insurance executives like having a posh lounge right there in Norway, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I think this is probably a loss for a lot of people. I, I actually, I think I've been in Akershus. I never ate there, never once. So uh, it's not a loss for me, but I think it's a loss for some people. Some people definitely. This thing is a little bit. You're part of the problem, not part of the solution, Eric. Uh, what about you, Matt? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, this is a big loss because one of the things that families go there to do is meet the princesses. That's like they're one of the, the hallmark line of characters that everyone wants to come see and for uh from my understanding is that there's going to be no at least right now only cinderella shows up at at royal table and then to have Akershus gone as well is a is a big hit to those families that want to meet the princesses um when i was there i had a family listen to well, i was listening to on the bus and they're talking about they went to royal table the day before and they said they left in their daughter left in tears and the mom was left in tears because she was so sad that her daughter was disappointed that she, she needed to meet Cinderella. And then obviously the, at that point, there were still a lot more COVID restrictions at that point. But then to not even have additional princesses there for her to at least see um, was also very upsetting to her because she was asking where Jasmine was and so on and so forth. So I think it's a big it's a big loss for especially families that have princess-obsessed princess uh, children. So I think it's it's a really bad move. It's a, it's a bad look. Well, just keep uh, keep this in mind, folks. If you're on a bus with Matt, he will be listening to your conversations. That's really what I've <laughs> taken away from all this. Um, <clears throat> Kamila, uh, I'm sure a lot of your people, uh, your clients yeah. book specifically for characters and princesses. I have so many princesses and princes in training who want to meet 
Jasmine and Ariel and Cinderella while they dine. That is one of the things I get asked the most about, and it still hasn't returned, along with the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique also, right? They want to transform into a princess mm -hmm. and then go dine with some. Um, so this hurts because full princess dining or, or character dining uh, really hasn't come back. And it sounds like there's a question mark about whether or not <clears throat> we will get them back. So, uh, you know, here I am thinking like, oh, maybe, you know, in the next month or so we'll get an announcement and maybe we still will. Uh, I hope we do though, because there's a lot of demand. A lot of people think of Disney and they think of, oh, you're going to have all these chances to meet all these princesses. Um, and right now that's not the case at all. Yep. Uh, I agree. So, um, one of the, uh, the you, wait a minute. Are you saying that nobody want is saying, "Mommy, Daddy, I want to go to the Florida Blue corporate, corporate Lounge." Nobody's <laughs> nobody's kid is doing that. That's that's weird. Um, so this is going to lead into our big conversation. And thank you guys for joining us so much. It looks like we have almost a thousand people watching right now. So thank you so much. Um, please hit the like button uh, so it helps other people to find it. And boy, howdy, we are going to get into it in a minute. But I feel like this is kind of like leading up to this is that there was a big announcement this week uh we captured the fact that not only were rise boarding groups available but at one point in the day rise was a uh, walk-on that you could do standby with rise this is insane because rise has been the problem right rise is is the root of all evil when it comes to why can't we get on stuff right now uh, that we want to get on. Why isn't fast pass there? What are virtual queues? Why do we have to get up at 7 a.m. to click a button only to be disappointed if we don't get it? Um, how is this happening, um, Eric? How how are you able to get on Rise? Uh, I'm not sure. I actually rode Rise today. I did it at your standard boarding group. What's up, boarding group 11? I really bonded with you guys today. Um, <laughs> woo woo! So then, um, <laughs> then later this afternoon, uh, another uh, blog reported that you could actually book a second ride on rise and they didn't have a source they just had like somebody showed a screenshot or something and i tried it and uh no it wouldn't but mm. it did it did look promising for a minute and they were flying through groups uh today now the entire ride was in b mode uh, of course the cannons were not uh functioning kylo ren was outside in his little spaceship flying around instead of having a gray wall fall on all those things uh, so maybe they're just cranking through groups faster. Maybe they're uh, lowering their standard for what level of operation that ride is in. Uh, maybe they've just figured out a way to get around some of their problems and they can handle more people. I, I don't really know. Wow. Uh, so you're saying that there could have been five animatronic mishaps and we just missed the Kylo Ren one. Interesting. Um, yeah, so I don't know that his animatronic was broken because there was a gray wall blocking me. But <laughs> that could be the problem. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, Kamila? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've heard stories of a couple of different things related to Rise recently that were interesting. Um, at Disneyland, I actually heard of uh, people who were just in the area at the end of the day, and cast members were like, hey, does anybody want to ride? You can just jump in line, and they were able to do that, which sounds amazing. Um, and then we're hearing more and more of boarding groups being available, you know, longer, not gone in five seconds, especially for the afternoon boarding group. I think that's actually been happening for a while. Um, that the afternoon boarding group uh, has, you know, been had availability for much longer. Um, I think this is great news. Whether you know they're able to increase the capacity, which is what happens, by the way, when you're not broken down for three hours, like my first experience on Rise, um, and you can't leave the queue because then you've lost your place. So you know, hopefully they figured some things out. Hopefully this continues. And if that's the case, that's great news for uh, people not having to maybe necessarily pay for Lightning Lane. Speaking of Lightning Lane, uh, we're going to move on to, uh, we're going to have a quick commercial. First of all, I want to say thank you to Rational uh, Prag Pragmatist. Uh, I hope I said that right for the two dollar super chat. We really appreciate. It. If you guys want to uh, just you know do super chats tonight, to if you you've got something to say, uh, you know we want to make sure we don't miss that. But you know, thank you guys for joining us. We're really excited to talk about this. And when I say excited, we're divided. So get ready because it's going to be <laughs> there's going to be a conversation. But we will be right back after uh, after a quick break. And uh, don't go away.
Welcome to Unplanned Downtime, the YouTube channel for all your favorites, including Cosmic Read Live, discussions and imaginary attractions, Deep in the Plus, reviewing the catalog on Disney Plus, Ink and Paint, celebrating female voices in the Disney fandom, WDW News Tonight, a late night comedy show with sketches and characters, Boxed In, opening mystery packages and viewer mail, Picky Eaters, trying to eat our way across Disney restaurants. WDW and TV RPG, a tabletop adventure set in Tokyo Disney Sea. And more of your favorites. Subscribe now at unplannedsdowntime.com. Remember, it's not an accident, it's unplanned downtime. <laughs> Welcome to Deep in the Plus. Each week, join host Rob Whiteside in a panel of Disney superfans as they take a different movie or TV show from the Disney Plus catalog, tell you its history, details, give their review, and let you know if it's worth your time. Current shows, classic movies, and everything in between. Watch Deep in the Plus live Tuesday nights at 9 Eastern for new episodes. Or catch Deep in the Plus anytime on YouTube at unplanneddowntime.com. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you again for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And uh, again, for all the people that are there, if you can give us a thumbs up, uh, just let people know that this show is here. Uh, this is really the first time on the network we've been really able to kind of talk about this. I mean, you guys may have uh, seen Tom's rant about this. Um, I don't know if you did. Uh, if you didn't, it was very on point. Um, but this week, Disney... Um, finally announced their plans for the future of FastPass, the details for Disney Genie, uh, but also the paid services for uh, for Disney now. So uh, since this is a huge topic, we're going to break it down into kind of two separate conversations. Uh, we're going to start with the planning episode, or, uh, picture of what, uh, what Genie is. They announced Genie back at D23 2019, and when they announced it, I was like, you know what, I'm kind of a Disney pro. I'm going to say that. I, like, I know the system and how it works and where to go and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not really too worried about that, but uh, back at D23, Mr. Chapek, uh, a fan of the show, I'm sure, uh, announced plans for something called Disney Genie, and uh, you know, and I immediately saw this for something that people who get overwhelmed, right, who don't like to plan, uh, who think that Universal is Disney's third theme park. Um, so. Uh, you know what, I just want to kind of talk to the entire panel about this, and again, we're going to focus first on the genie part of it, and then get into the madness. Um, so I'm going to go to our travel expert first, Kamila. Is is genie, am I right, is genie for people who uh, who have never been to the parks or don't like to plan, or is it for everybody? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad we started here because I think just the general concept of Disney Genie kind of got lost in all the talk about the new paid fast passes. Um, but what we're getting in Disney Genie, and look, we all will have to still wait to have our chance to test it, but it's starting with an itinerary and planning tool. And some of you may remember back to the first time, even the second or third time you ever walked into a Disney park, it's overwhelming, right? There's all these people around you. You have to know which which way to go, what ride are you going to first. These are not necessarily things that you think about if you're not a Disney pro like so many of us are. And most of the people who are reaching out to someone like me as a travel agent uh, is because they are looking for help on planning. They want to have a great day in the parks. They're spending all of this money to go uh, visit Disney World, and uh, they need help understanding what it even is. And you're exactly right. Most people don't even realize Hollywood Studios and Universal Studios are not the same thing. So a tool like this that is going to help you uh, figure out what rides you want to go in and for free, by the way, figure out what time might be the best time for you to go to those rides, right? So you're going to be able to say, I want to ride these 15 rides and it's going to say, okay, here's what you're going to start with. And you're going to be able to enter the park and go right on. And look, there's a lot of services out there that do exactly this, but who would know better than Disney when is the best time to hop on Peter Pan's flight? And it's going to adjust in real time, all for free, offered to everyone. I think this is huge. I think this is going to be a wonderful tool for a lot of guests. And honestly, even as someone who knows how I like to do my park days, I'll use this. Why not? Okay. Uh, first of all, 
Rob Bazemore, who uh, I give a hard time because he, uh, we're at odds on some things. Great movie ride for one, but uh, gave a big uh, twenty dollars <laughs> super chat and said Disney Genie Plus rocks. Um, I don't know if you're being facetious <laughs> or not, my friend. I'm really not. I'm not sure. Uh, Jennifer Garner said, uh, "For me, it's the Fast Pass. That Fast Pass uh, doesn't include all the rides. We're going to get to that in a little bit." Um, and then Erica, thank you for the super chat as well. Um, let me just say this, because when I first heard about this, what I thought, and Kamala, I could be completely wrong on this, but I feel like it's going to recommend things it wants you to do, not necessarily the things you want yeah. to do. That I think it's going to go, hey, and, and again, most of the things at Disney I like. I am very pro-Disney. I drink the Kool-Aid and then I have another glass. So I'm definitely pro-Disney on most <laughs> things, but this is this one, um, so Genie, the Genie itself, I'm afraid is going to say, hey, you should go to the, the Pixar Shorts Theater and then uh, swing on by, um, you know, the uh, pretzel cart and then go on over and do Turtle Talk with Crush because you'll love that. And then the people who don't know any better are going to leave the parks going, OK, I didn't wait in line, but I didn't do anything that was miraculous. I don't know what people see in Disney. So um, I feel like it's going to guide you away from Soren and Test Track and Frozen Ever After if you don't know they're there. Now, if you want to be, you know, on those attractions, like you said, I see that in the video it says, okay, great, you can go in and you can get, uh, you can say, I want to be on Frozen Ever After. And it'll say, great, the best time to do that is either 20 minutes ago, sorry, you missed it, or it's in five hours from now. So make sure to be there. That, that would be very cool if it worked. If it worked, that's the challenge that I have. And Eric, I don't know how much uh, like confidence you have in this, but this is an experience inside an app that we already know is not great. Correct. So I want to dip my toe into this, and we'll start with this broader conversation about my Disney experience. Uh, we can talk about Shop Disney and all the really kind of these IT interconnected uh, things that they have. And I think um, it's great. I love the idea of Genie of having a way to help you kind of budget your time. Um, what I don't like is a scripted, um, wrote, line by line planned um, day in the parks. Um, but more importantly, I want things that are designed to enhance your experience of the park, but not things that are designed to be the only way you do something in the park. And I'll tell you why. Um, my father is in his 70s. My mom's in her 70s. Uh, everybody here has parents and grandparents that, I mean, they were born around the time of D-Day, right? Uh, a lot of these people carry like an Android phone that, that lives at 10% battery life and they play Candy Crush on it and take pictures that they don't know how to send to anyone. Um, I'm concerned that they are blocked out of the full Disney experience when you start saying you need the app for this thing. And we could talk about boarding groups because that's really not a genie thing, right? I'm afraid to even explain to my father if he wants to come over to Disney on his own with his with his wife for a, for a day, um, how to go about getting a boarding group. It's already too complicated. Then you have, and these are people who are have difficulty navigating apps that are stable and intuitive. Uh, my Disney experience is not a stable and intuitive app. Um, it has become more beautiful recently, but half the time when I open it, uh, it has a screen of my little chosen avatar and nothing, and my name and nothing else, and I have to reload the app to get everything to work. Um, so to do all these extra things outside the app is a little scary to me. I like that they want to enhance your visit. They're adding features day by day. I just wish I had more faith in this app. I wish the interface were more intuitive and I wish in general that this uh, discussion took place thinking about everybody because a lot of people who are not of the digital age are really going to miss out on some experiences when you start, uh, you know, even mobile order. You know, when they start making mobile order kind of mandatory at most of these uh, places, uh, that is, that's a huge hurdle for a lot of these people. And I'm not, I'm not picking on my dad. I'm just saying in general, uh, Luddites or people who are not accustomed to navigating technology, people with old phones, people with junky phones, people that want to use their, you know, they have a jitterbug phone. I don't know. Uh, I want to stand up for those people and say, I want them to enjoy the parks too. And, and I wish that there were ways to do it that didn't require an app and knowledge.
Okay, before we move on to Matt, who I, I has some pro opinions as well, I, I need to unpack a couple things. First of all, I have an Android phone, so you just shut your mouth. Secondly, um, I, I agree with you, though, that I think this the, the entire system is too complicated, right? It used to be you would <laughs> – that sounds old. It used to be, back in my day, you would walk into Six Flags, and you'd ride your rides, and you'd eat your funnel cake, and you'd leave, and you didn't care, and you didn't plan, and all that. You know what? It's it's really frustrating. I'm sorry, and I was not disparaging Android. I was just using an example, which it's, happened to me. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's all good. We're all friends. So the the thing is, though, that when you would go into the parks and you would just say, let's let's see what today brings and here are the rides I want to ride. And, 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 you know, you would just do it. And that's the thing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second when we talk about the paid side of it. Um, but I do think that things are way too complicated and they've been way too complicated. I guess you need a, a park pass to get in. You have your park pass. Great. You can't park hop until two. Why not two? I don't know, but you can't. And then, you know, hey, uh, you, you know, uh, you need to to have the app to be able to tell you where to I mean there's just so many things right now like you said about mobile order and all that so I, I agree it's it's a lot and, and Kamila I don't know um, how like the average person who doesn't go on a regular basis is able to consume all this because we live it and breathe it because we're inside the bubble all the time and it makes sense to us finally but it takes it takes us time to kind of learn and navigate it so I do think that's a, a big deal also I think it's funny uh, Michael 23 uh, gave us a super chat and the super chat is super chat is the lightning lane of YouTube comments <laughs> you're not wrong that is perfect. Um, that is definitely something to talk about, but thank you for the super chat anyway so that you could say that. So I'm going to go down to Matt now and let you have your two cents on this one. Ready? Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say my excitement's more with Genie Plus and Lightning Lane, but I think with Genie Plus, GD, the standard edition, as you could say, um, I think it's going to be kind of the kind of the culmination of Disney's efforts to crowd control. Uh, we've we, that's kind of the the behind FastPass was a way for them to, to control crowds and get certain places people into certain attractions at certain times, and that's just how they're going to do it. Um, so I personally am going to enjoy the idea of being able to check crowd levels, check um, the the ride popularity and things like that because something as as Disney fanatic as, as I am I know that the weeks and sometimes months before my trip I'm checking out to see what wait times there are like during certain times of the day and, and so forth so this would be a way for me not to have to do that anymore and just that morning look at what uh, Junie's going to tell me is the best time to go to um, let's say Smuggler's Run or um, Big Thunder and not have to kind of meticulously plan this out months beforehand so for me it's it's a big stress reliever that i have this app that's gonna tell me when the best time to go ride a certain ride or go to a certain restaurant things like that so i think it's a way that's going to relieve um, even us that go often and also um, to the, the new guests but i think there is going to be a, now a larger learning curve um, when going to the disney parks now that's saying that's the one negative because before it's kind of like you can just show up and uh, your travel agent can tell you that you can go get a fast pass um, at this booth and things like that. So I think there's a larger learning curve. Um, and <laughs> I think it's to, to the benefit of us uh, veterans that we won't have to worry about navigating through some of the newbies. Um, so that, that, that is one kind of positive for us uh, frequent travelers. No, but see the problem is you're going to get you're going to get stuck behind Eric's dad with his 10% Android battery yeah. life trying to figure it's out true. if he's in the right place because his phone yeah. told him to be there and you're going to be behind him. So already your and there's camera 500 people on there's 500 people on Swiss Family Treehouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry Kamila, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I was just going to say, you know, I I think what I like about Disney Genie is it's a tool, right? You don't have to use it, but using it and knowing how to use it will probably enhance your vacation. And I, I, I absolutely agree with the concern that, you know, once again, it's putting us on our phones, we're looking at it, we're checking it out, we're using it to um, manipulate things. And it's time that you're, you know, spending down at your screen and not up and with your family. And I think there's absolutely something there. All of these apps drain your phone so much. So, you know, add, uh, get Getting an extra battery or a portable charger to the packing list and by the way those aren't cheap so add that to the cost of everything if you don't already have it um, I think there's absolutely 
uh, something to that that I think has to continue to be worked out. But I think going to Disney for some time now has been something that you have to navigate. I mean, for some time now, it really hasn't been, oh, just walk in and, you know, head to Buzz Lightyear. And even at Disneyland, which has kind of this mix of a paid uh, Max Pass version, and then it had the free Fast Passes. Look, I've been to Disneyland more recently than I'd like to admit where I utilized a free Fast Pass. It is not fun to walk to all of those rides, get your little ticket, and by the way, you can only have, what, one, two at a time, um, and then see what time, you know, you can come back, and then walk to, you know, whatever your next ride is. You're exhausted by the end of that. So, you know, planning tools continue to be important, uh, particularly for a Disney park day. And, you know, I think this is just Disney trying to do, frankly, what other people were already out there doing and having a lot of success. So why wouldn't they say, you know what, it's my data, it's my park, I'll tell you where I want you to go. And just one more quick thing, uh, I don't think Disney wants 200 minute lines. So. To, to the extent that they're moving people around where they want you to, yes, <laughs> yes. They, they, your people are not happy waiting in these long lines. And one of the biggest deterrents, particularly for some of the luxury travelers, is they think that it's just one big long line. And Disney wants to get away from that image. Wow. That's a lot. Okay. Uh, that's, Sorry. I mean... <laughs> No, that's okay. It's going to be a very emotional night. Um, I just feel like, um, you know, you're right. You you want to move people around, but I do think that that who will end up paying for that is normally going to be the person who uh, doesn't know what they're doing. That is, they'll get they'll get slighted. Yeah. I mean, but I will say, those same guests didn't even know Epcot had an aquarium. Didn't know that the big golf ball was actually a fantastic ride that you must check out. So people were missing things anyway. No, you're right, and I absolutely know that because I literally heard somebody, a little kid, tell their parent <laughs> that the big ball had a ride in it. And so I definitely know that, that and that's recent. That wasn't a long time ago either. So um, I, I get that. But I also think that with Fast Pass, we had people distributed also to these rides as well because you had to pick three Fast Passes from Epcot. You got the one you wanted and then two kind of throwaways, and then you had people going to those rides and making those lines longer at those rides, whereas in Madison's kind of we're, we're you know we're kind of experts about this stuff so we're like oh we'll get a figment there won't be a line and you get there and it's a 30 minute wait and you're like what i don't understand did they did they put the original one back maybe i didn't know about that <laughs> but it's really that they just they went into the you know the fast pass and they distributed it and people are like oh i got a fast pass i guess i gotta go um and see what this is all about so let me get that skunk spray in the face and then i uh, i'll never come back um, so, you know, I, I think that Genie overall, I get what you're saying, and, and I do think that it will be helpful for people who don't have uh, park experience, but at the same time, it says it's going to be ever-changing. So I have this schedule, and it says here where I'm going, you know, to this, and it, it may, you know, call an audible on me in the middle of the day and send me somewhere else. Um, that part of it, I don't know how that's going to work either. But Kamila, like you said, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that we haven't seen this yet. Maybe it'll work. But I do think that it will drain your phone. It will be complicated it to explain will. to people. And it will be, you it know, will. the the the, uh, the architecture of my Disney experience app, as much as, again, I like to drink the Kool-Aid, it's it. I, I get so frustrated when I'm, like, in a hurry to try to do something and the app shuts down and shuts down and shuts down. Uh, it or, or it says, oh, you don't have a hotel reservation. Wait a minute. What? Uh, yeah, I do. I was there this morning um so all that kind of stuff's a little bit complicated so let's go ahead and just j dive into the second part you guys go with that we just dive into the second part yeah. because the second part i think is where we all have huge frustrations and again maybe not all of us maybe y'all at the bottom are loving this i don't know but we'll, we're going to find out in a second but again if you're here we appreciate you please give us a thumbs up uh and uh let us know that you're here and that you are a part of the conversation don't give us the thumbs down because uh you hate disney uh uh, fast pass paid because we didn't do it um so for the second part of this conversation let's talk about paid fast pass uh but a recap fast pass is a program <laughs> that ran from 1999 to 2021 uh before that you would just go to the parks like i talked about you would grind from rope drop to lights out and everyone had the same opportunity right you waited in line with everyone else you had you didn't have your phone kids we didn't have phones to keep us entertained it was crazy uh you actually had to spend time with your family it was gross um but worst. also 
<laughs> also, <laughs> Disney uh, was always great with crowd management, right? Uh, they had multiple dining, uh, entertainment, character experiences, uh, lots of stuff to keep you entertained. Like, and they had pre-shows and themed or interactive cues uh, to bring that ex an experience like no other. I mean, they changed the game. So when FastPass came, it was like, okay, it's cool to be able to skip the lines, uh, you know, and it was free to everybody, and you could go in. Get and it was free with your admission. Uh, you run your favorite attraction uh, and make sure you had your spot. My parents used to go. Here's all the keys. You run and get you know Toy Story or whatever, and then you meet us and you know. And I would just go and I'd be that guy putting the cards in the machine, getting all of the everybody's fast pass. Um, but I mean that was. <laughs> You know, that was the cool thing about FastPass at the time, that it was available to everybody. Um, then in 2013, the game was changed again with My Disney Experience, where, again, it was free to everybody. You could pick three things, right? And, but you had to do it like a month or months in advance to know that on a Tuesday in June, I want to be riding, you know, uh, it's a small world. It's crazy. Uh, but again, they allowed you to do it. And like you said, Matt, it was like there was a little bit of stress in kind of trying to schedule all that yeah. out. Um, but it was included with your admission, right? Uh, and it was only at Disney World, though. And then they finally launched a similar program, as Kamila mentioned earlier, in California in 2017, which was Max Pass. And it seemed kind of absurd to me to pay $15 uh, per day per ticket for this service. Uh, but it allowed you to make one reservation um, at a time the day of and then make another and another. Uh, and then you also could still do the free Fast Pass if you wanted to. But it also included Photo Pass for the day so that... And then you could buy a package that would add it to your annual pass. Uh, so it was still, it was still seemingly okay because it was like 15 bucks added to your ticket and the convenience was there. This new system is so healthcare. I mean, like picking out a health plan, uh, picking out a, a, a cell phone plan in, in 20, uh, 2001, like complicated that it's like, okay, you've got your G genie. And then you've got Genie Plus, which is, hey, you're going to pay $15 a day in Orlando, or you're going to pay $20 a day in Disneyland, because you also, in Disneyland, you get Fast Pass or Photo Pass still, but you don't get that in Disney World, just to make it more complicated. Um, and then once you do that, you're all good, right? No, because then you don't get access to everything. You still have to do virtual queue. You still have to do Lightning Lane. Um, so I, for me personally, this, this creates a haves and have not situation that if I want to ride the ride and I got the money, I can do it. Some people who've been saving all of their lives to go to Disney get a lesser experience than those people who are just going to go and pay and pay and pay for things. That's the problem that I have with it. But now that I've had my little rant, I want to throw it to Eric and let you talk a little bit about it. Oh boy, where to start? Okay. Um, one of the things that people will point out is that when Disney World first opened, they had the e-ticket booklets, right? So that was a paid add-on, essentially, where the e-tickets, the e A, B, C, D, e-tickets, had an assigned numerical value. Um, I think admission plus the book of e-tickets was like four fifty to $5. Adjusted for inflation, your trip to the Disney parks in 1971 in $2021 was about $31. Um, a single day admission now to the Magic Kingdom varies due to an algorithm and all this complicated stuff. I don't know. I'm an annual pass holder. I don't check the day-to-day -day prices. Um, we know who the Disney leadership is now. And when someone shows you who they are, believe them. And it is our fault if we're surprised by all these multiple upcharges that are going to be uh, rolled out. Bob Chapek never pretended to be our friend. He never pretended to be anything other than a blood-sucking vampire that he is, right? So you are the carcass as the guest and the Disney executives are the wolves splitting it up. Uh, this additional revenue uh, is gonna, what, what is it gonna be used for? Do we think it's gonna be invested into the parks? Do you think they're gonna have a war chest set aside for an emergency so they don't lay 32,000 people off the next time their revenue briefly declines? You know, no, I think it's gonna be rolled, I think these are, people hitting revenue goals. I think Bob Chapek is saying, hey, uh, you, um, you, I'll get you a bonus of $5 million if you can increase per guest spending by 5%. Hey, you, I will also give you a 1% bonus if we could do this, that, and the other thing. I think that's what's happening here. These are people uh, who, you know, granted other people have paid fast pass. And if it was just paid Genie Plus, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be a little disappointed. And it certainly looks better than what they rolled out in Paris, where you're going to pay nine euros for Peter Pan's flight 
and eight euros for a space money. You pay a different price for all these things. It's even more confusing, right? But to add this confusion, and then that paid fast pass doesn't even include all the rides. That's that's just a little hard for me to defend. I think it's uh, I think it's sad. I think it's disgusting. Um, I think that um, this is just uh, you know nobody ever want to. This is corporate America now. No, Disney's a Fortune 100 company. None of, these, none of these people ever went on their quarterly conference call and they said, well, how was revenue? And they said, well, it was about the same, but a lot of people were really happy with their experience at the park. Right? You get fired doing that. They have to demonstrate growth um, to keep their jobs. And that's the unfortunate situation that we're in. And that's all this is. They want to increase per guest spend. That's it. Okay, Kamila, I, you said you have a, a positive spin on this. Tell, tell me what you're thinking. Well, let me start here. Uh, Disney is not a charity. The goal and the purpose is to make money off of you having a great time at their resorts. And if they do that, hopefully you will visit again. I also think Disney is so good at what they do that we thought that fast passes were free, but actually fast passes have always in some form been something that you've paid for because if you were a resort guest, you got first dibs at fast passes. So if you wanted to get on those hard to get rides, Seven Dwarves, Mine Train, uh, Flight of Passage, you know, whatever is the new hot ride, I mean, good luck if you weren't staying on property and paying more to do that, right? Oh, and by the way, if you pay even more and you stay at a club level, we'll give you six fast passes. So Disney has always said, uh, to some extent, uh, at least more recently, we're going to give you these advantages for essentially paying uh, to do even more with us. So this is just kind of the next iteration, which they've been testing out for some time at Disneyland. And I will say, uh, I can remember, you know, within the last few years, not using Max Pass, and then I can remember the first time I finally broke down and used Max Pass, and it was a game changer. And I couldn't care less about that, you know, fifteen dollars I spent. I was like, why wasn't I doing this sooner? How, you know, how dumb was that? Um, so I think that Disney, you know, has been kind of conditioning this for some time. It's never been as free as we thought that it was. And, you know, just speaking up for uh, probably, you know, most of the clients that I work with, it's not a big deal. I think the people who are the most upset are probably the pass holders who are used to, you know, paying their whatever amount they pay, $1,200, whatever, and just being able to go when they want. Um, and, you know, there were people who knew how to use the fast pass system to their advantage, right? They knew that if you refreshed often enough, you'll find that flight of passage, unicorn, fast pass. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll get some good options, but most people didn't know that either. So they were still waiting in those lines. Um, and, you know, the last thing I will just say quickly is, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about technology issues. We've talked a lot about issues with the animatronics. That's not free. Uh, even a technology change like this, and as anybody who has worked in corporate America will know, can cost millions of dollars. So to some extent, you know, what we're paying for could literally just be the cost of this software and technology. But I absolutely think Disney had to do something because what we had before was not working. And so I think the reservation system and understanding, you know, crowd levels and how many people are in the parks, being able to direct those people to where they want, they had to try something because what we had before was not wonderful. So I, 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 you make some great points, but before we get Matt, who's going to like pile on with greatness, I'm sure, um, I, I, I do want to interject a couple things. So one of them is, I get what you're saying, is that, you know, we were paying for it before. My problem is like build it in then. Like build it into that price because let's not play games. If you are raising the price on us and that's where this is coming from, then go ahead and do that. Don't do it like, you know, oh, well, this is a side add on, this is a side on. So we know what we're going into, what we're getting when we go into it. Um, that's the that's part of the problem that bothers me. Eric was talking earlier about the ticket system, and I know on you know, news tonight they talked about what the ticket system was and how that worked with the e-tickets and everything. You know, you paid a small price and then you got a booklet that said which rides you could ride. Now, you then they were like, oh, let's roll that all in and just have one price and you get to ride everything. 
And that was awesome. That's what distinguishes Disney from the state fair. Because you pay $5 to get in the state fair and then you pay $5 a ride or you buy some tickets and you have to use two tickets for this one so you don't really know how much you're spending. This was all inclusive for all intent and uh, for all purposes, right? It was just all inclusive. Now you're taking that away, but you're not taking that price down. Over, over time, the price keeps going up and up. And I feel like that's what's been paying for all of that stuff you've been talking about, the, you know, the, the maintenance and all that other stuff that we've been paying that price by the raised prices, by the fact that they didn't give us any money back on our annual passes because they weren't able, we weren't able to park hop or because there's one less water park or because you, know, you don't get all of these entertainment offerings they were paying for, but now they're not, but we're still paying the same amount. So I think all of that to me is a little bit of a problem and it's just again huge disney fan it's just rubbing me the wrong way because i feel like it's gouge 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 and i get that they are not a charity but they also know that we yeah. will continue to pay it that's going to be the problem we're going to continue to yeah. pay it and you brought up max pass and i agree with you when i first heard about max pass i was like i'm not gonna i don't want to do that but i got there and it was convenient that's mm -hmm. the thing, right? Yeah. It was convenient. So I was like, mm, I'm only here for a little while because I'm not local to Disneyland. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pay that. And I'm like, oh, I, I just got off of Radio Springs Racers. Let me see if I can get something for Guardians. Just got that. Boom. Let's go over here. But it was a little bit of that running back and forth still like you were talking about. But you didn't have to go to the attraction. So but can I just um, say really quickly? Yeah. I, I think it's fair to point out that as a, an industry, the theme park industry, has moved in this direction uh, and uh, there are days at Universal more than probably most people think or realize where on top of your day ticket which could easily be $159, $179, you also have the option to purchase an Express Pass for not $15, not $20, but $250 on peak days and that's per person. So uh, I think yeah. they watched you know, SeaWorld and Universal and other parks charge these outrageous amounts and nobody complained, they just did it, or they stayed at a resort where uh, it was included, um, but you know, that could easily be a thousand, two thousand dollars a night for some of those. And I think they said, yeah. you know what, I want some of that too. That's rational. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. disagree with you on that one. Uh, Eric? I was just going to say, I don't want to get us too far in the weeds, uh, but specific to Rise of the Resistance, because um, these are uh, these stories that we covered earlier of it, uh, allegedly being a walk-on uh, yesterday or the day before or whatever, um, some of these things are due to kids are back in school, right? The parks are a little bit down uh, right now. Uh, actually, a lot of hotel reservations were canceled due to um, COVID outbreaks and things in the area. Um, but in general, it's very difficult and very competitive to get a Rise of the Resistance boarding group. Uh, there are currently um, two official ways to pay to get on Rise of the Resistance already. Uh, one will be a Galactic Star Cruiser Reservation, and the other being get a VIP tour. Um, mm -hmm. So those are actually placed ways that were not available uh, recently. Actually, actually, obviously, Galactic Star Cruiser won't be able to be available until it opens. Um, so the, com the competition for those boarding groups um, is going to be gobbled up now by all these paid people. So uh, Galactic Star Cruiser, let's say they got three, 400 people a day that are, that are taking up some of that. Uh, you have your, your VIP tours, uh, and then you're going to have, we don't know what the people will pay to get on Rise of the Resistance. That leaves very little room for the rest of us, right? If you're not paying, you're not riding. So I think pe that rubs people the wrong way, right? This has become a pay ride. Yeah, I agree. Matt, sorry, it's your turn. And no, I, I, go. I, 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 I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Um, I have a lot of thoughts here. And I want to frame this as I'm someone who owns his own business. I'm someone that uh, has my MBA. So I come from kind of corporate America. And I've been in those business meetings. I've been in those budget meetings. And I think, Eric, you're right. That's what they th they thought is that they need to find a way to raise in revenue. And this is how they're doing it. And, and I think the the trope, the the often talked about have and have nots is becoming more and more part of the Disney experience. I think we've we've been living in that world for a long time. And I think for those of us who are in the Disney bubble, we realize it's happening. I think a lot of people that aren't in the Disney bubble are finally realizing it because like Kamala said, if you had a club level, you're getting extra fast passes anyway. And I think for us to be in this kind of mindset that fast pass was a good thing, I think I think it's a misnomer because I don't think Fast Pass was a good thing at all. Um, being back in there in July, I there's no Fast Pass at the time other than there's disability access, which you can call it a Fast Pass or not. It's a, it's a virtual queue in a way. 
my, the the displayed write times were almost were were double of what I actually experienced. So from an actual experience of, of living without FastPass, I think it was really enjoyable. Um, and I think for me, it either needed to be no FastPass or paid FastPass, because let, let's be honest. If I and I, and I think the the backlash that I've seen from social media and things like that have come from a lot of influencers who are annual pass holders. And I think this definitely hurts the annual pass holder. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say mm -hmm. it doesn't because every time you go to the park, you're paying an extra $15 on top of your, your annual pass. But for guests that come once a year, every other year, this is a great thing for those guests because if they don't get a boarding group at 7 a.m., they have the, still the chance to get on Rise of the Resistance. And I think there's this whole narrative around, well, Rise should have a higher per guest like uh, capacity per hour. I don't think it needs to have that because for the experience you have on Rise, it's a very calculated and um, precise process that I think wouldn't really lend itself to a higher capacity because you have that really great three-stage attraction. I think it's, it's Ride efficiency is right where it needs to be. Um, and then, and then two, like for myself, I'm a once a year, um, park goer. And so if I want to hit all my rides because let's say the, the, the lines are too long and I, and, and for anyone in the chat or anyone that's, um, having up or have, if you've never thought to yourself, I would love to just pay for another fast pass to get on this one ride. You, you're lying to yourself because like I said, when I was back in there in July, I went to um, studios late in the day, and my son wanted to ride Slinky Dog Dash. We we fortunately um, got some Disney magic and was able to get on the ride pretty quickly um, due to a really gracious cast member. But if that didn't happen, we would have waited a ninety minute wait, and not I, I would I would have paid that fast pass in that moment because the, it was a couple hours before park closed. I knew it was I knew it wasn't going to ride without a fast pass or something happening, and we luckily enough that happened. But um, I, and, and for families with kids, I think this is even more advantageous because, yes, you are paying an extra $15 per day on this and additional fast passes if you want to pay for those. But as for a parent, waiting in lines is a nightmare with kids under the age of three, four, five. Um, so if I can have a way that I can keep them walking around the parks and then know at the certain particular time that I can get on the ride, I think it's, it's a great thing. It's a very positive thing for families with younger kids and things like that. So I think there's been this big uproar on social media. And I think it's, it's a misnomer. I think, I think crying wolf right now, it's, it's, it's crying wolf because if the community was so annoyed that we're paying so many extra things, you wouldn't see these influencers buying every single ear hat, every single, your head, but and at the same time, they're complaining about an extra fifteen dollars dollars per day. It's it's a time that we need to like figure out our priorities. If your priority is to buy every wishable, every pin, and then complain from the other side of your mouth that you're mad that Disney's trying to get more money out of you, you're part of the problem. Because if we really wanted to speak with our dollar, then you wouldn't see these angry uh, people on Twitter about, oh, I'm so mad about $15, but then going and spending $300, $400 on a new drop each each and every month. I think, I think if you really wanted to speak with your dollar, then start doing it because the executives at Disney are saying, hey, like we obviously are seeing this public outcry, but people are still spending money. People are still coming. So it's it's really our fault at the end of the day because if we really were upset with these executives, we wouldn't be spending the money, but we still are. And they're going to find each and every way to get the most dollar out of us. And I, it's it's they they, they see the numbers, and we're not we're not we're not telling them otherwise at this point. Okay, we, we're telling them we're we're still going to spend the money. All right, let me jump in, Matt. And first, let me just say I love you. Um, however, um, I, I do think that there there is a difference between wishables where you're making the choice to buy merchandise and something where you're already in the experience and then they go, but wait, to get the rest of this experience, please pay, please insert $15. I think there's a difference there. The other part of that is that you, you were talking about people not, you know, maybe, you know, maybe not clapping back, but, you know, we've talked about this on the site. This article on par the Disney Park site has 1.4, 1 like 1,400 thumbs up and 13,000 thumbs yeah. down because, and, and I get what you're saying that maybe there, this was related back to influencers, but not completely. There are people who are looking at this going, this is not what we wanted. This is, I mean, this is, this is not right. And I get what you're saying too about Rise because I hate 
getting up in the morning. I just hate it, especially on my vacation mm -hmm. and getting up at yeah. 650 in, in the morning and having my app out or three of us having our apps out and going, okay, you're, you got it. You're, all right. Ah, we missed it. All right. Go back to bed and we'll just be angry for a little while. And then we'll go into the park and see if we can catch it again at one o'clock. I get what you're saying about buying that extra experience, but I think that's not the right answer. I mean, I feel like the virtual queue, here's why I think the virtual queue has to exist is because like you said, there's no high capacity on that attraction, which means that if they made it, you know, Disney has a policy that if you're in line when they shut down, you have to, they have to let you on the ride. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. if you're in line at Rise and the line happens to be seven hours, then that's going to be a problem. They've let it happen with, with Flight of Passage with three hours long. They let it happen with, um, with you know, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway at 90 minutes. I mean, it, but they wouldn't let it happen with Rise. And I think that's made a, more of a demand, which has made this a horrible system uh, in the meantime. I don't disagree with you about the fast pass thing, that it's maybe better not to have them. I mean, mm -hmm. I have not, I've kind of enjoyed the fact that they, they haven't been there at the same time. There are some experiences that I haven't done because I didn't have a fast pass, uh, you know, yeah. Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, for, uh, Frozen Ever After, things like that that I don't want mm -hmm. to wait in line for. But I do wait in line if I really want to ride it or if my kids really want to ride it or if, you know, grandma or grandpa would want to ride it, then we would definitely do that. Um, that panel that I just showed you, I watched that video. I don't know if you guys watched that video. This guy is, has got a panel of Disney experts who are clearly fed questions. And, you know, it's like, hey, you know, it's like one of their surveys to pass holders, right? Right. It's like, hey, Dave, what do you think? You know, what what are your tough questions? Let's hear your tough questions. And he's like, OK, well, what if I have too many dollars in my pocket and I'm not sure where to spend them? He's like, what if I'm an annual pass holder and I want to go in and, you know, and get this? And they're like, well, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that, Dave. Um, so here's the thing about that. You're still going to have that great opportunity, like everybody else, to spend fifteen dollars whenever you go in the park. Come on, you talked about Max Pass. That was like when I had my annual pass for Disneyland for a year. That was included in my higher level. Mm -hmm. When they bring it back, yeah. it's at the same or higher, higher, higher price than it was. But now it doesn't have that Max Pass, and now I'm gonna have to pay twenty dollars a day out there for it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of nuts. <laughs> but is it though? I mean, as an annual pass holder, let's say you pay. I don't know, $1,300, right, for your annual pass, and you can go multiple times a week. If you didn't have that annual pass, you'd be paying about $6,000 plus uh, if you were, went once a week. So you're still getting, you know, benefit compared to if you didn't have it. And who knows, maybe Disney, you know, just to get the annual pass holders off of their back, because I do think that's the people who are the most upset about this, maybe they'll just let you add it on. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll add that in just to kind of make you all go away. Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like that's on there. But and, and again, I get what you're saying. But also, there's something to be said for an annual pass holder that they are a loyal customer too. And and you're right that they're you're spending less each time. But overall, you're probably spending more uh, over over yeah. time because you're there more. You're spending you know more dollars. And that's again the other side of being an annual pass holder is that you do go and you probably probably spend more because you are a super fan of everything that they're doing and not just the casual person that goes there once. Um, but when you go in to do that, you're spending all this money already. And then they're like, oh, by the way, this more. I really feel like if they had charged just $20 more to the ticket and every, this was still included, that would be okay. But they're not, they're not raising the price. They're, they're nickel and diming across the top to people who don't know. I feel, I feel like, I feel, I feel like it hurts the people who don't know. And, and, I, and I get that that's kind of the, the misconception here is that I yeah. feel like it, it hurts the people who don't know what they're doing more than the people that it hurts uh, who do. But again, they could add that to the annual pass, whatever, that's fine. Here's the other problem, though, is if you're buying that G Genie Plus and, and then you, you pay for these other, these other rides, you've got to still get up at 7 o'clock in the morning still and hope that you can get those things. So even at that point, it's not, you know, and, and Matt, it, it's a very pretty picture to think, oh, you walk by Rise and it's like, hey, Billy, you want to ride Rise? Yeah, let's go ahead and pay that, you know, extra money and ride Rise. It is not that cut and dry. And also think the fact that Rise isn't included is going to make a lot of, again, the people who don't know, very mad when they find out that they paid for Genie Plus and they're not getting everything. So I can also see, Rob, um, a scenario where uh, a couple years in the future, there are just more and more tiers of guests, right? With, of course, the annual pass holders at the bottom. Um, I can see where you get 
um, maybe a discount or cheaper um, Genie Plus if you're a Disney Plus subscriber or ESPN Plus subscriber or Hulu, whatever. You do all these things. And we've already got, we already have a pretty well established tier of guests. Um, this is a company who has very publicly taken on uh, a progressive stance on a lot of issues, um, promoting inclusion and all these other things. Uh, but yet they're making ex uh, experiences, what once you get into the park, more and more exclusive. It seems contrary to their overall mission. I know one of these is more like cultural sensitivity and inclusion, and the other is just excluding you because you're poor. But I think it's important, um, you know, it's an important thing to consider that, you know, you have a lot of the guests that are coming here that are still can spend to get there, and they're not going to get the experiences. And I think that's unfair and unfortunate. Yeah, and here's another thing that I get making value to these things too. Like Genie Plus has value because if you spend the fifteen dollars, you know you get to pick out your attractions one at a time, and you don't have to go. Uh, and then also they have these cool little filters that if you do, you know, you get to have those filters. But I do think that's one of those things that some some maybe kids will go, well, why can't I get that filter? Oh, you didn't pay the money. Um, but it, but it's a it's a give and take, right? Like you need to value them higher. So you want to give them other things, and in it's the fifteen dollars in uh, Orlando that gives you those extra filters, but in uh, in Disneyland they give you the you know the the twenty dollars gets you also uh, photo pass downloads. So uh, it you know it's a give well, and take. Well, and again, I think I'm going to write this home the point that I was talking about earlier. I think this is such a positive thing for the the vacationers that go to Disney because. Annual pass holders. I know that that's a, that's a big part of the community that um, is on the site and things like that. But I think for for single year vac or like once a year vacation, this is nothing but a good thing because you we bring up the point of let's just raise ticket prices. Well, it, at this at this point, it's Disney's giving you the choice whether or not to raise your ticket price or not. This is not something you have to pay for. I think that's something that the narrative is kind of forgetting is that this is this is an elective service this is an elective uh, add-on to your ticket and if you are like i said this is your only time ever going to disney or the first time going to disney or your annual trip this is nothing but a good thing because you could have that experience where you're waiting in less lines you get more done this ride where any you know, pass holders yes it is another 15 dollars you have to add on to your look if you look at your annual price for your your pass but you have, you have more chances to get on rides more often and um, be there more often to, to I think if their goal, though, Matt, not to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Um, I think Go if ahead. their goal is for the to improve the experience for the vacationers and the um, resort guests, maybe they would have a bundled thing for the duration of your vacation as opposed to 15 bucks a day per person. And, you know, so maybe they will in the coming. future. I, yeah. 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 No, I think, I think that's coming. It has that, to come, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, think, to travel I, think agents I think it's an add-on you can do. Yeah. Be an add-on. Wait a minute. Yeah. So, so I, talk talk about that, Kamila, because again, I feel like there's too much going on here already. Because you've got yeah. to get a park pass, you've got a regular pass, but are you going to get a park hopper? But do you have an annual pass? But do you get the genie? Right. Do you get the genie plus? Do you get the lightning lane? So, what else the is coming? The menu board is going to be crazy. Yeah, on top of that, what else? <laughs> what else do you th see coming? <laughs> Well, I mean, all you know, all they've sort of signaled to us so far is that uh, there could be ways to bundle it, so that way you're not having to every night at midnight, you know, go to add this in. You can just add it into the package uh, for however many tickets, uh, you know, are included with it, uh, or it could be something that's a la carte. Um, they haven't given us any specifics or dates, but we had a webinar on Friday, um, and they did kind of signal that uh, that it sounded like that was something that was going to be coming. Um, but you know, I, I will just say this as someone who works with people who are booking you know ten fifteen thousand dollar vacations and also someone who will get people who are clearly trying to make some magic happen for their kids and they want to know you know can I get to Disney for a thousand dollars fifteen hundred dollars um, and, and oftentimes the answer is yes. Now, what that looks like, you know, we'll I'll work with you on that. I want everyone to be able to go to Disney World and have a wonderful vacation. And I think that looks like different things for different people. But I will say um, the way, the places where Disney actually gets the most expensive for the average family that's trying to book a trip is not in this paid fast pass service, right? I mean, for my family to go to Disney, it's at the Enchanted Rose, in isn't it? At December, well, no, it's it's honestly families who have 
uh, more than two kids, right? If you've got two adults, two kids, that's one thing. If you've got five, good luck finding a fifth sleeper. And oh, me heaven forbid, you know, you've got six, seven. You want to talk about an expensive vacation? The prices on hotels, Disney resorts, skyrocket. Um, so you know, if we want to really think about how do we make this a more inclusive uh, vacation, let's start with the different room types and having value options there. Because I see so many families of five, six, seven get completely priced out immediately before we ever even get to, you know, some of these types of details. So, um, you know, I want everyone to have a chance to go to Disney World and I hope that they take some of the feedback. I mean, this is not without criticism. I wish it was free. I don't know that it would work uh, quite the way they want it to if it was. <laughs> but look, they've come out and said it's not. It's $15 for my family to go in December. It's going to be $240, I think I calculated. Um, and I'll be honest, for how much we've already spent, Here's your $240, Disney. But see, that's how they get Give you me, right, right because the they know we're going to do this. To Matt's point earlier, it's yeah. like, oh, you know, I, I'm, we're just going to add it on for a better experience. And you're talking about that, too. We're just going to add it. But they, they know they're yeah. going to get you for that. And because yeah. the, the, one, the only way out of this is for us to go, you know what, we're just not going to go anymore or we're just not going to do this. And if we're the only ones who aren't doing this, then, you know, right. do, it does impact my trip because if I'm not the one who, if I didn't pay for Genie, Genie Plus, everyone who did is passing by me while I'm in the standby line. And so well, here's then, the problem too. Right. Yeah. We, if we all stop, go, if everybody in this chat, and if thousands of people said, forget it, I'm not going. Um, it's going to fun. It's going to punish the cast members before it ever punishes Bob Chapek. Right, that's a great. There'd be a round of layoffs before he loses a bonus. Yep. So you're kind of in a in a catch twenty two here. Um, if you mm -hmm. want to speak with your wallet, that's great. The problem is that when you speak with your wallet, the first people that pay for it are the people whose fault it is not. Yeah. So uh, and can I know. just say Wait, really quickly? I hold, do hold, hold oh, that sorry. thought. Rational pragmatist said, um, "Don't forget they're removing Magical Express, which we can talk about all the things that's they're right. removing, but that could be another that's call." Right. Uh, Go ahead, come on. Uh, just really quickly, I was going to say, I do think that there is a ceiling to how much people are going to be willing to pay for these mm -hmm. vacations to Disney. And I, I do think we're starting to get closer than we might think and that they might think to that ceiling. And I want to use the example of the Christmas party tickets, which just went on sale. Uh, if you want to go in December, it's going to cost you $209 per tick or per person uh, per ticket to go. Uh, I planned a trip in December with the idea that I want to go to this Christmas party. I want to see the little nutcrackers, uh, you know, walk in, in the parade. I want to do all of that. As soon as I saw those ticket prices, absolutely not. I don't need to do it that badly for a four hour vacation. Get real Disney. You're not that good. Yeah. Well, that's so I do think there's a ceiling. Yeah. And that's one of the things we talked to, or that we didn't talk about with the news is that not only is the Oogie Boogie Bash sold out now officially, but the Boo Bash is down to like one night, and that's that mm -hmm. private night ticket too, and all those tickets are gone. So again, back to our point, like if we wanted them to get back to what Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party was at a lower price with more benefits, right. we we just told them by sh by by selling them out. No, we're good with these high, high, high price you know tickets because we know that then that's an opportunity for us to get into the park to ride those attractions without having to pay for the extra fast pass because we know we'll be able to get and, in with that and can i just say we can't underestimate the fact that most oh. guests going or a lot of guests going don't know that it's any different they don't know that paid fast pass didn't exist previously mm -hmm. that the uh these uh special events parties used to you know be more than what they are right now and they're still booking it so uh, you know uh, but there are there's there's still, there still but there are audience. people who haven't been in a while that probably go and they just get lost because if you were one of those people that went in 1999 when the paper fast passes were there you're just you're going to be completely like what the blazes happened that's so, why you work with the travel agent mm, <laughs> wow there's a good plug so one we're one free. other thing we're one free. one other thing and then I, uh, we obviously got to wrap up i could honestly we could talk about this all night but i wanted to you know uh wrap up with this and again if you're watching we appreciate your time uh please give us a thumbs up and and give us your feedback and your comments below because we definitely want to hear from everybody um this is a this is this is our community right uh, disney is is our thing our love our shared passion and so you know we want to hear your thoughts on it and we hope that those thoughts get back in a constructive way to the disney company so that they can maybe retool some things but one of the things that felt very elitist to me or kind of you know how there was that quote that set tom off from josh tomorrow 
Uh, you yeah. know, that, that quote, Gary Daniels, the VP of digital experience at Disney parks, that was in this video, um, said they were, you know, in one of those canned responses, you know, we're still going to have that standby option available to guests if they don't want to pay. What? Oh, you're going to let us stand in line? Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That to me Except for Rise is, of the Resistance. Yeah, exactly. Except for Rise of the Resistance. Or now Ratatouille is going to be the same way because Ratatouille was announced as a virtual queue. Or Web Slingers. Or Radiator Springs Racers. All, you know, all of these things. So, or, or, or. But when, you know, at some point you're going to go, what am I really getting with Genie Plus? Oh, I'm getting Figment and I'm getting the Carousel. Cool. Um, but when he said that, I was just like, okay. Fast Pass is dead. And talk about money. How many places in the park does it say Fast Pass, which is now going to have to say Lightning Lane? And again, Tom <laughs> joked about it. it's going to just be a big sticker over top of it that just says Lightning Lane. Uh, but I mean, they're going to have to rebrand everything because everything for years has been yeah. Fast Pass. But for him to say that, clearly, A, it means the free option is gone. And this is the first time that's happened. Even when we had Max Pass, Kamila, we still had the ability to do the that's free right. version. And now you don't. So that to me is again this this is it makes it different. And yes, Universal has had these priced things that you know you can buy the Express Pass, but the Express Pass goes any ride I want, I can go ride. That's, that's right. it. So when I mean that's watch. yeah exactly. So I mean it's pretty cut and dry. Although I'll, I'll say this, um, Spencer was just here, and he, I, these are all Universal Express Passes that he had left over. He's like, you want these? Are good till September first. Oh, okay. um, these are good on any ride <laughs> except for. Jurassic uh, World Velocicoaster. I was going to say so, Hagrid's. Yeah. yeah. No, they're good on Hagrid's. They're not yeah. good on Velocicoaster. So All right. So, doing it. so again, thank you guys for watching. This is I a terrible go, reason to do anything. I want to go once around for final thoughts. I'm going to start with uh, Kamila, and we'll go back around to the guy in the backward hat, as they're calling you in chat. You know, I, we will see uh, what this actually looks like when it launches. Um, I'm very curious to see the first few people testing it. That's going to be really interesting. But I would just say, you know, in all this conversation, don't forget about Disney Genie. Disney Genie is free. It's for everyone to use. I hope it works as well as it could and should but if disney genie does its job if you don't pay for the paid fast class option or the paid disney genie plus option uh disney genie should be able to guide you around the parks and limit the amount of time you stand in line we'll see yeah okay good good points uh matt yeah one thing i was thinking about while we're uh, sitting here talking about this is that i i know for myself i'm very privileged to be able to go to Disney, much as I, I, I am. And I and me personally, I don't have VIP tour money. But I think looking at this modeling system, I have Disney or Genie Plus money and Lightning Lane money um, because I think that was um, something that I always wanted to try out. But I think I'll get at least a, a light version with Disney Genie Plus. So I think it's, um, like I've been talking about this whole show, I think it's a really great thing for those annual visits. Um, and I, I'm really excited to see and interested to see how this rollout goes because I, I am skeptical of the of Disney's technology. But if it works, I think it's a really great benefit to um, – a lot of guests and they might not realize it at the time but i think it's going to be uh, a positive thing for the general experience that's a soft flex matt i got that disney genie plus money yo <laughs> <laughs> um i have no idea if i have lightning lane money because i don't know how much lightning lane costs it's like when you look at a, a menu at a Good steakhouse point. and it says market and it might be a market price who knows with knowing these guys yeah probably will be um i'm uh you know I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt on a couple of things we've discussed tonight. Uh, Lightning Lane, I'm not big on. Um, and I think we're just this far from having paid tram rides and paid stroller parking. So cross your fingers uh, that though they haven't uh, green lighted that yet. I'm sorry if anyone from Disney's watching got an idea. Um, but, you know, yeah, Fantasyland stroller parking is premium. So maybe. Uh, Why would you speak that it? into yeah, no. existence? Why yeah. would you no. speak that into existence? Because trams That's haven't come true. back. So Fast Pass <laughs> hadn't come back. And now it's come it's back so paid. It's, it's so ridiculous. It just might happen. <laughs> wait, wait, tram. Uh, do you got to put a quarter in the side. Sorry. That's the only way the door's open. <laughs> if you put a quarter in the side. That's the only yeah, way that's to where do. I draw my line. Draw my yeah, line exactly. Um, Animal Kingdom tram costs like twice as much, too. 
Oof. Well, thank you for joining us on Park Center. We had a lot of uh, new faces uh, watching tonight. So thank you. Thank you for all the super chats. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope we get to see you again. Every Sunday night we're here from 8 o'clock, uh, you know, covering the issues that concern the Disney community, talking about it as a group. As, instead of you hearing from one, you hear from all. Uh, and hopefully tonight you got different sides of things. Whether you agree, disagree, again, leave us a comment. Let us know how you feel. Be kind, though. Uh, we, there's enough nastiness in the world. Just be kind. Um, and then on top of that, I want to say... Um, Eric, I love that shirt. Um, that oh, shirt. Where, where can I get a shirt like that? This is uh, CarouselOfProducts.com. This is our newest drop. Disney in the streets, Universal in the sheets. <laughs> Check us out. CarouselOfProducts.com. Twenty how, bucks. You get a nice uh, logo on the sleeve too. So. That's how you live your life, right? I get it totally. Um, and then again. Um, it, we love our wigs members so if you guys are not familiar with our patreon program uh patreon.com forward slash wdwnt to find out about um the, our wigs program and our wigs get a post show which boy howdy i'm hoping you guys are ready to to chat it up in in, in post show um because we are here uh to to uh to field any questions uh, and talk about anything that has to do with anything disney so we will be doing that but again Hot topic. Uh, I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk about it. As more details roll out, I'm sure we'll have to have another conversation about it. But uh, Kamila, Eric, Matt, thank you guys so much for being on. And thank you guys for watching. We will see you guys next time. Have a great night. Oh, 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 oh.